Ruth Dr. Reed Powder. She is a consultant um, psychiatrist and she works in uh, sexual medicine, empty psychiatry, fellowship in psychosexual medicine, uh, former, former associate professor at Nepal Gunj Medical College and she is associated with Sri Virendra Hospital, Kathmandu. Now, um, over to you, Dr. Reed Powder. Thank you, sir, for some warm uh, welcome. Uh, good afternoon, chairpersons, and good afternoon, the audience, seniors, and uh, respected doctors. Today, we are going to discuss about erectile dysfunction. <coughs> so, this is the topic. Sex has always been a constant source of motivation and a focus person of interest to humankind. Sexuality has always been a part of our culture. Uh, sacred arts, idols, paintings, participating various uh, god and goddesses in various sexual acts are widely uh, prevalent in the Hindu religion, not only in Nepal but also in India. So sexuality has always been a part of our culture. There are various books written about in temples of Nepal and other parts of the world. So women's sexuality is the way in which we experience ourselves as sexual beings. Sexuality is an integral part of our personality and it, it is determined by anatomy, physiology, biology, away from India. And similarly, uh, there is no any community level study to show the prevalence of various sexual disorders in Nepal. But a uh, short study of ours found that premature ejaculation is the most commonly encountered sexual problem. The community has by recurrent inability to achieve or maintain an erection during partner sexual activity. activity. So uh, basically both the definitions from international consultation of sexual medicines and American scientific association are basically the same. This is the deviation criteria which says that at least one of the following three should be present in most of the situation in partner sexual activity around 70 to 75 to 100 percent of the occasions. Uh, mark difficulty in obtaining a reaction during sexual activity, uh, mark difficulty in maintaining an erection until the completion of the act, and mark decrease in erectile rigidity. And it should be persistent for a minimum of approximately six months and it should not be by should not be explained by any other non-sexual disorder. We can classify erectile dysfunction variously. According to the duration of the problem, it can be either lifelong. Also, maybe I have like to like this one, so it may be acquired. According to the situation in which it is present, like generalized, in all the situations where the partner is having uh, sexual uh, activity, whether it's home or it's uh, hotel with any partners, with any erectile dysfunction, it is generalized. But situationally, in some specific situation, if a patient has a, a failure to maintain or uh, have, have an erection, like sometimes what happens there, uh, especially in honeymoon, honeymoon couples, they go for honeymoon and there the partner can have an uh, erection. Uh, but you will be regularly having that during other time normal uh, sexual activity. So that can be called situational. So according to etiology, it can be organic, psychogenic or mixed. But basically most of them have a mixed etiology. According to the measure of male aging study, in the US, the prevalence of erectile dysfunction in aged women are 40 to 75 years. 70 years was around 42. And as you can see in the graph, from 40 to 70 years, uh, the uh, occurrence of uh, erectile dysfunction in men uh, rapidly shoots up. Similarly, another study also showed a prevalence of around uh, 60, 6 to 64 percent, an average prevalence of 30. So it is a disorder and naturally which occurs in age to mates from more than 40 years of age. Uh, we are not going to discuss about the normal mechanism of uh, erection but basically what we have to understand is that any arterial obsession in the penis or damage to the cavernous bodies or venous leakage. When the person has erection, uh, the arterial flow to the penis increases. This dilation of the covered cavernous muscle which compresses the penises. 
So, due to that, the beta CDKs cannot have it. So, RTL uh, flow is increased after system instrumentation and beta CDKs is also blocked because of that reason, erection um, is maintained. But if beta CDKs happens, then the erection won't be there. So, all psychiatric disorders, even erectile dysfunction, and the biopsychosocial model, we all have been understanding previously which has a biological, psychological and social uh, cause factors. Biology like our genetics, uh, evolution, similarly psychology like our personality, partner choices, uh, partner's attitude towards sex, similarly social like um, concern aspects, religious beliefs, these all things in are intermixed together to cause any type of psychiatric disorder, even in a type of Drug addictions, or sedentary lifestyles, they are also uh, one of the cause factors for erectile dysfunction. Cardiovascular risk factors are very common like hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease, dyslipidemia, uh, diabetes mellitus, these are very commonly associated with erectile dysfunction. Especially these disorders are also seen in aged men. I mean, uh, being more than 40 years of age. So, because of that also the prevalence in aged men of erectile dysfunction increases. Similar endocrine factors like hypogonadism, hyperprolactinomania, uh, hypothyroidism, uh, this can also lead to repair dysfunction. Medical disorders like hepatic insufficiency, renal insufficiency, COPD, sleep apnea, spiny cord injury, polyneuropathy, these all are one of the medical causes of repair dysfunction. <coughs> there are also uh, tricyclic amine depression like uh, probipramine, dimipramine, uh, uetectiline, opioids, and other products are anti hypertensive especially. <coughs> Uh, non selective beta blockers, propanamol, thiazide diabetics, this can also cause uh, erectile dysfunction. So, these all things should be also be inquired. <coughs> so, how does uh, the erectile dysfunction occur? Generally, these are there are some sometimes what happens is there are some trigger factors like difficulty putting on a condom during sexual activity, uh, during the rush, or whatever the patient has uh, difficulty trying to find the condom or to put the condom and because of that there is kind of tension or anxiety which may cause to uh, failure uh, of the erection or uh, early relaxation of the uh, penis. So that triggering mechanism can lead to a contributive factor next time. The patient may remember that okay, last time this thing happened because of that I did not get an erection. Maybe I won't be able to get erection this time also, next time also. So because of that stress and uh, factors, the erectile dysfunction continues. So other factors are economic problems, symptoms of alcohol, consumption of side of patients, all can act as a psychological uh, factors that triggers erectile dysfunction. There are other psychological factors for erectile dysfunction like sexual beliefs or myths. Um, men should have a larger penis, men uh, should uh, always be erect. So these are various sexual beliefs myths uh, that can also be very like this person. Sexual schemas like cognitive uh, phenomena about uh, cognitive attitudes about uh, uh, body and sex. Like uh, I can't perform, I'm incompetent, I'm important. Uh, these type of schemas that the patient may have, that also may lead to erectile dysfunction. Similarly, automatic thoughts during sexual activity. Sometimes what happens during sexual activity, the patient may think that, okay, what happens if I can't get a reaction? What happens if I won't uh, able to last longer, like last time? So because of those thoughts also, uh, their uh, reaction mechanism may fail. <coughs> Similarly, effective factors like performance anxiety, equity stress, and psychopathology like depression and anxiety disorders are also one of the common causes of Partner and relationship issues are also very uh, <coughs> common cause for erectile dysfunction. Like uh, trying to show the over distance love, trying to know of love, uh, shows like intimacy, passion, and commitment. They are very uh, uh, intertwined with each other. So for a Good sexual relationship, there should always be romance, love, care, uh, sensuality, uh, attraction, these things should be there. So, power struggles, betrayal, uh, uh, partner's attitude towards uh, the patient, physical appearance, this all can uh, lead to a uh, 
problem of defense is concept in the mail. Similarly, contextual factors like daily stressors, serious financial struggles, unemployment, fatigue, these all can also lead to erectile dysfunction. <coughs> so now these are the these are the approaches <coughs> how to diagnose or how we should approach uh, case of erectile dysfunction. So diagnostic assessment should always be performed with the partner first and one erection. Then the sexual history, in sexual history we should find the problem with difficulty in attaining or difficulty in maintaining the relation. These things will be uh, what are the triggering factors like we already discussed. Primary or secondary to another sexual dysfunction, lack of desire. There is no desire for sex, there is no any you know, wish to have uh, intimacy or sexual activity, then that may also lead to erectile dysfunction. Is it generalized or situational or does it occur in every situation? Uh, or it is situational, it only occurs in one partner and doesn't occur with other partner or in one situation it occurs in other situation it doesn't occur lifelong or acquired <coughs> nocturnal or and morning erections should also be in bad because nocturnal and morning erections are generally seen in every person every day uh, during REM sleep uh, there is a natural phenomena that uh, uh, male will have erection every night and in the morning so that if that natural erections is there in the patient, it generally rules out uh, organic etiology, not 100 percent, but it generally rules out because uh, normal mechanism for erection is present, and cyclical mechanism will be playing role. <coughs> Similarly, distracting thoughts will be in the worst. Like maybe a fear that somebody may disturb, a fear may like the inwards may descend to us, and they may sound uh, that we can go to the other room. So these things are also constantly bothers the male mind and because of that also the patient may be able to have an erection or lose the erection body. Similarly, sexual schemas and sexual beliefs that we already talk, sexual activity and satisfaction prior to the onset of erectile dysfunction. <coughs> what is the distress about the problem? The patient distress or is the partner distress that the male can have an erection? So these all the things should be required about. Psychological history, you should ask your mood or fatigue, any body image concerns, attractiveness, special, special penis size, which may be having an infinity complex of his penis size or body dysfunction type of features, mental disorders, uh, psychopathology, personality characteristics, self esteem, self efficiency, these things should also be asked. Previous relationships, social skills such as learning or social networking. Like stressing factors such as financial, work, job stress, will also be asked as psychosocial history. Relationship and partner issue we already discussed. We will ask for love, intimacy, trust, power dynamics, individuals, where these things are can also make any relationship uh, better. So without that, uh, without these things, love, intimacy, and sensuality. Uh, sex may not be very crucial sometimes. Similarly, so, communication skills and partner sexual function, the attraction between partners, how the couple cope with problem and pressure may exaggerate symptoms, uh, partner's attitude and reaction to, towards his sexual problem, and partner's sexual act activity and physical activity, how long they uh, try the foreplay and how, what are the that uh, are involved in that activity. So these are all things should be required about uh, uh, erectile dysfunction uh, in history. There are some factors that may suggest a non etiology like if the word onset is solid, if the patient is young, if there is uh, presence of nocturnal patients, what the patient cannot have any erectile uh, if the patient cannot have erection during a partner with a partner sexual activity, but there is no thoracic erections. Similarly, so, erections while masturbating, best While the patient masturbates, he can get an erection, but not with a partner. So this all can lead to non uh, can give a hint towards non-organic etiology. <coughs> so there are some uh, differentiating factors between organic and psychology. Like age in general in organic, it may be for older, in psychogenic it may be for younger people. Onset is generally organic, it is gradual, except for trauma and surgery. Uh, for psychogenic, it is acute. Substances are global. In organic, every situation, uh, 
uh, there may be irregular types also, but in a psychogenic it is only situational. Symptom scores are this consistent or progressive or intermittent. Desire, uh, normal or decrease. Organic risk factors are there or not. You may also suggest organic etiology. Partner problem, anxiety and fear. So these are some factors that can differentiate between uh, organic and psychologic etiology of uh, erectile dysfunction. These all factors can be uh, classified into predisposing, precipitating, and maintaining factors. Uh, like any other disorders, these factors may sometimes precipitate, sometimes trigger, and sometimes also maintain the erectile dysfunction. Maintaining factors, for example, relationship problems, uh, poor communication between partners, uh, lack of intimacy among between partners, precipitating factors like new relationship. Pregnancy and child also, these all factors can sometimes predispose or predis precipitate or maintain the disorder. <coughs> so now, after history, we should do physical examination, which is very important. Sometimes we just think that the patient is in the this the patient may not be able to uh, identify his uh, physical problems or physical uh, deformities. So, general screening for medical risk factors or comorbidities should be done. <coughs> Evaluation of secondary sexual characteristics is also very important. Assessment of the cardiovascular, neurological, and genital system should be done. And focused physical examination generally for the penis and uh, should be done. Like number three, we have testicular atrophy, pyramid disease, or uh, hymosis. So that may also be contributing to ED. If the patient is going to be Another important factor is prostate examination. So that should also not be missed. So there are some common laboratory tests that we should perform. So that is same total test testable, prolactin, uh, thyroid cancer test, uh, RBS, uh, screen for diabetes, and limit profile to screen for lactic uh, So there are some tests that is, are available to uh, uh, see whether uh, to perform the other kind of test. Nocturnal penile stimulation and disability. It is also called uh, Rezi scan. This test is generally used to differentiate between uh, psychogenic and organic uh, erectile dysfunction. So this uh, it is a patented uh, machine called Rezi scan. Uh, it has generally two loops, and it is uh, that two loops are tied. One loop is tied to the base of the penis, and other to the tip of the penis. And the patient is asked to. I mean that device is uh, attached to the patient's thigh and is monitored for the overnight sleep, like alter machine for the cardiovascular activity. So what we have together is that this uh, sorry. So these uh, uh, things measure the uh, erection at night. So if uh, the patient has nocturnal erections that we talked about, so that will be measured and that can be read uh, overnight. So if one erection is there around uh, 60 to 70% of rigidity and uh, it lasts for around 10 minutes, so generally that will rule out uh, organic etiology because patient, we can definitely say that patient is having uh, nocturnal erections. So this can be used if the centers have it. I don't think we are having this in uh, Nepal, I guess. Similarly, another choice of uh, test is intercavernous injection, it's like an uh, invasive procedure. Intercavernous injection of uh, vasodilators like Papa Varin or even it can be used. And you can see the even in a very small dose that we will talk about in the lateral side of the penis, uh, that is copper cavernous. Huh? So, uh, after around uh, 10 to 15 minutes, there is injection because of these vasoactive drugs uh, are vasodilators. So absence of uh, erection may lead to may give a hint towards organic etiology or damage to the venous system uh, can be assessed. Similarly, same principle can be applied to use color droppers. Uh, the passive agent can be given uh, to the penis that we talk about, and uh, color dropper is performed by radiologist. We can see the anatomy of the so whether if there is any venous leakage or venous blockage or uh, arterial malformation, these things uh, can uh, be found with this uh, test. So it depends on the centers. Some centers in India practice this, but not all centers 
Again, I think we don't even have these uh, medications for IVUs like pepavirine or elustradi. And but sometimes uh, they also do palatopla uh, and without this drug. And it is not practiced, but uh, without that drug also you can see the penis. But that one give a I mean, if the factor of penis or other uh, thing about the musculature, if any damage is there, that can be seen. But the uh, anatomy, arterial and venous anatomy, can be seen without those drugs. <coughs> There are some standard questionnaires that we also should uh, take into review, like International Index of Erectile Function, which is a widely accepted uh, uh, questionnaire that can be used for erectile function, which has uh, five uh, uh, five uh, domains. So erectile, uh, there are 15 questions. So in erectile function domain, there is question one, two, three, four, five, and 15. Orgasmic function, sexual desire, intercourse satisfaction, and over satisfaction. So in all these 15 questions, there are five responses. So for erectile dysfunction, we only see answers for this erectile function domain. So severe, the score is 1 to 7, it is severe in 58 to 11, it is moderate. 12 to 16, is it mild to moderate. Uh, 70 to 28, it is mild. And uh, 22 to 25, it is uh, no erectile dysfunction. So that can be performed. A simple sexual in encounter profile can be asked sometimes. Like the questions are, will you able to achieve any erection? Will you able to insert the penis in your partner's vagina? Uh, do, uh, did your erection last enough for you to have successful intervals? Uh, were you satisfied with the high of the erection? Were you satisfied overall with this sexual experience? So these things can be asked with the partner <coughs> and with the patient. So lifestyle motivation, treatment lifestyle motivation is the first uh, approach. Uh, this is very important. and. Uh, in this lifestyle motivation, you should ask the patient to refrain from any drugs like nicotine, alcohol, or uh, sedentary lifestyle. You should encourage the patient to uh, exercise or even have a cardiovascular exercise or walk around the job. So, these all things should be. So they are very important. We said that the more your leg moves, the more your penis will move. That means, the more you exercise, you will have the impact So, that's <coughs> Hypogonadism should also be explained if testosterone work is low, but uh, the scope of this uh, seminar is going to talk about testosterone replacement therapy. But in brief, if uh, hypogonadism uh, comes with irritable dysfunction, uh, replacing testosterone can uh, improve the general improvement in sexual function, it can improve sexual desire, it can improve mood and energy. Uh, you can improve the orgasm and ejaculation and improve spontaneous and nocturnal relations can occur in the hypogonadal way. <coughs> so, purify inhibitors, Viagra, the blue pill, which uh, is dubbed that the blue pill changed the world. So, it was uh, introduced in 1960, in 1998 it was approved, and after all, uh, it was widely marketed and one of the widely used uh, medication. Uh, for uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. So the basic mechanism of action of PDG5 uh, inhibitors is that a sexual stimulation, uh, side or touch or forte activity, this causes uh, parasympathetic fibers to this nitric oxide from level RG and it triggers the monolite cyclase which converts uh, monolite uh, one and triphosphate to cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP is the most common uh, important neurotransmitter for erection, which is what which is rapidly broke down by PDE5 to other metabolites. So cyclic GMP, what it does is that it causes influx of calcium to the arterial smooth muscle and it causes relaxation of the arterial smooth muscle and it causes increased flow in the penis and uh, erection happens. So as PDE5 inhibitors rapidly metabolize this, if we inhibitor inhibit this PDE5 by certain of the other pre inhibitors, then the injection may last long. So that is the basic phenomenon of pre inhibitors. So there are various pre inhibitors available in the market. Most commonly used are certain of it, and Tadalafil. They are different in range, I mean, uh, uh, dose, uh, their starting dose and basically the duration of action. Uh, sorry. Sheldon has a dose value of 25 to 100 mg and a target value of 50 to 20 mg. 
but these are generally short acting I mean, it doesn't but Tatiana Fino is one of the drug that is very long acting the T-Max itself is around 2 hours so in the case if you are prescribing the uh, Tatiana Fino is um, basically ask the patient to participate in sexual activity after minimum of 2 hours otherwise it won't work so that is the basic difference even uh, Tatiana Fino has a very short uh, T-Max the duration of action also is around 4 to 6 hours for all these drugs but for Tadalafil is long lasting around 36 to 48 hours so that's why Tadalafil these days are also used as a uh, daily prescribing pill because of its long action and because of that uh, long action it can be it is not related to the sexual activity I mean the patient doesn't have to uh, pop a pill and then go for go and have sex you can take that pill before and and uh, Sexual activity may not be linked with the uh, ingestion of the drug. So, in uh, side effects, also basically most of the side effects are the same, and they are given that uh, frequent side effects are headache, blood flow, or dyspepsia, and muscle congestion. But this side effect back pain and uh, is more common in Tata Lakhi. Similarly, color visual disturbances is more common in Sedan and Hills. All these side effects are basically more or less uh, similar for all these drugs. Sildenafil <coughs> and Vodanafil uh, headache is most commonly uh, encountered problem and even the patients present with that. Uh, I had a severe headache so I stopped the drug. So for that, for that reason, sometimes you can also give a paracetamol tablet to take along with uh, Sildenafil. So there are some non-responders non to PD5 inhibitors. So these are non-responders. Patients should be exposed to a minimum of four of the highest tolerated doses of these two drugs taken sequentially, not concurrently, with adequate sexual stimulus. So, if even after taking four of the highest, preferably eight, four of the highest tolerated doses of these PDE5 inhibitors, uh, one after one drug, not together, but one after changing the drug, with adequate sexual stimulus. If sexual stimulus is not there, then that nitric oxide will uh, be released, so they won't never work. So uh, they are called non responders. So generally, 30 to 40 percent of the patients are non responders. So those patients who have, uh, you can also uh, don't get reaction with that uh, intercavenous injection, they are also non responders. And generally, they are non responders. Generally, they no offers a dysfunction or uh, uh, dysfunction in the uh, Atten supply or penis supply of the penis maybe the reason. So it is said that there are also some pseudo non responders The patient takes the dose at the basically what happens that if the patient really takes a drug, so what he thinks is that okay, I'll pop up this drug and I'll have an erection even I can have an erection and go around in the park and walk around like that. But it is not like that. If, even if you even if you take the uh, pill, if the patient takes the drug, but uh, he doesn't uh, actively participate in uh, sexual activity, there is no stimulation, there is no foreplay, then the dog drug will never work. So this type of <coughs> counseling should be done. <coughs> and if this uh, just taking the drug and without any sexual stimulation, then it is said that uh, your penis will won't get erect, will get erect or yes, and nothing else. So, re-counseling of the patients, re-education about the mechanism of action, duration of action and the uh, pharmacokinetics of the drugs should be explained, when to take it. Uh, we also forget to discuss that sildenafil and cordenafil, uh, these drugs, if they are taken with fatty foods, they delay the absorption. So, if the patient is having even that fatty meal and uh, the absorption of the drug is delayed around 1 to 2 hours. So, that these things should be explained. Sometimes uh, high dose PD5 therapy includes uh, for these non responders and switching patient to another PD5 inhibitors can have also have a uh, favorable outcome. There are some factors in which we can we should avoid PD5 inhibitors like myocardial infarction or stroke of life threatening or like or like threatening arrhythmia within the last six months or resting hypertension or hypertension on your angina with sexual intercourse if the patient had a unstable angina with sexual intercourse in that cases 
organic nitrates and if I have taken their absolutely contraindicated like nitroglycerin, nitrosoloid, mononitrate and nitrosoloid, dinitrates and nitric oxide donors. So in that cases, in nitrous cases also, if the patient is taking nitrates, in that case is also uh, BDE5 inverts in the uterus are contraindicated. So there are other oral therapies also, various like yolbin, real arginine and real citrulline. So these all drugs are sometimes used off the label, but there uh, no any randomized control trials or any uh, evidence with data or any guidelines about these drugs. But they are sometimes practiced, so we should also know your <coughs> So what are the other medications? After uh, oral medication, there are other uh, therapies also that can be used. Like accumulation devices are there. It is uh, available, I guess, in Nepal also, in India also it is available. So what is the basis of this is that a vacuum uh, pump. Uh, it is either powered with an electrical device or it can be manual also. So it, this the pump is inserted in the flaccid penis and there is a constricted band which should be rolled down in the base of the penis. And when the vacuum is created either by putting this lever or this power motor in the electric mechanism, so it creates a vacuum in that uh, cylindrical structure and it causes uh, the penis to be erect. And uh, after that, the uh, constriction band can be rolled down in the base of the penis. And because of that, the constriction band, the venous drainage won't happen and the erection will last. So these devices are also used and uh, can be used. <coughs> uh, so they will be useful with PD5 inhibitors and injection therapy post uh, surgery. Reported satisfaction are also considerably 35 to 85 percent. And most men were satisfied with the uh, vacuum injection devices, continue to use them long term. So adverse effects are also only mild, like bruising, local pain, fatigue to exaggerate. And serious side effects are very rare. But sometimes 16 necrosis has also been reported. So these are also one of the first line drugs and first line therapies. Especially in those patients who doesn't want to use PD5 inhibitors, uh, who has a side effect uh, to start with PD5 inhibitors. Similarly, the same uh, diagnostic therapy of uh, intercamerosal injection therapy can also be used for uh, treatment as second line. There is classoactive drugs like like prostatin, pathovarine, and fentolamine. This can be uh, inserted in the Corpus cavernosa with a small gauze model 25 to 30, and because of that, because of the property of the vaso uh, active drugs, erection occurs uh, and the patient can perform that. But this is a invasive procedure, some patients uh, may not uh, like to perform this injection on their penis, or those issues are there. But it is also one of the oldest therapies, same is used even before the use of uh, PD5 inhibitors. <coughs> Similar various other uh, similar mechanism working drugs are available like we call it intra-urethral like which is available in the brand of rules in Western countries. Medicated urethral system for injection. In which this pellet is used to uh, insert the pellet of uh, yellow prostatin in the urethra and similar by absorption of that drug it also causes erection. So even side effects include pain and pain and dizziness. Sometimes triavisions are also reported. Another new type of therapy is low intensity extracorporeal soft wave therapy. Uh, our device is used to give various type of soft therapy to the penis and it says that uh, it causes the revascularization of the uh, neuroanatomical structures of the penis. So they are also uh, used and research is going on with these uh, types of therapies, but they are also not supported by evidence. But it has some place in low Indians in uh, sexual problems and uh, nowadays we keep this but because of lack of uh, sexual medicine expert in our country and I, I, I usually get uh, emails from Professor Rao, uh, please send somebody for fellowship. It started when we had a conference in Lumini. Uh, so from that time he used to ask some Nepalese psychiatrist who wants to go for fellowship and I, 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 I was very really happy when Rita opted for it and he completed from the same university. So now I think we get, a, we get our opportunity to refer patients if we are not able to uh, treat
treat those patients and I think you can do justice for those cases. So this uh, forum, uh, Dr. Rick presented it very well. I think uh, now I will take few questions if anybody wants to have some queries. Thank you, Dr. Reith. Uh, that was a nice presentation. So, when you mentioned about the etiology and biopsychosocial one, uh, you very well elaborated about the psychosocial factors, uh, etiological problems that lies in patients, the cognizance, and family. And but when the treatment came along, uh, we were seeing more external devices and application. Because, see, as a psychiatrist, we generally get this biological etiologies filtered from at dermatologist level and uh, these hormonal abnormalities. When we get, we have patients with psychosocial abnormality. So, and, and many times there is moral dilemma, like a case that came to me, a young male and a person, unmarried male, and told of having multiple uh, partners and had this uh, erectile dysfunction only when the partner said that we have only half an hour uh, to perform. But when the partner is ready to uh, stay for overnight, now he did not have that problem. So the pro problem lies that, that what counseling to do to such patient, where there is more moral dilemma as a psychiatrist, and, or what advice to give, what drug to prescribe during that time. So can you please help in uh, such situation? Thank you, Dr. Ramon, for this question. The, what you said is a classic example of situational erectile dysfunction. It occurs in particular situation when we, we talked about it. When a patient says that, okay, let's hurry up, let's finish the job in 10 minutes or half an hour. Or sometimes what happens is a patient has a lovely relationship going on in home, he has a beautiful wife, a sexual convenience is also good, but suddenly he is forced to his girlfriend. There is only time of around 6 hours, 7 hours, so he has to go there in a bike, take a bigger room, buy a condom. And because of that, that anxiety and tension that someone may report you or the hotel staff may see you, I will report in the CCTV camera like something like that. So, so that type of anxiety also leads to classical case of reply and response in the situation. So it can be sometimes resolved with counseling, but as you said, uh, if we get the patient, uh, counsel the patient, talk about the situation, take the time, ask about the other things involved. I am Dr. Mahindrabhai. I have a question. Uh, you already mentioned that uh, pre ejaculation in, in the problem, uh, premature ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, these are common with the responses. But uh, some patients came to my clinic that they have uh, sexual arousal, uh, extramarital <laughs> relationship, but with the wife, they have no, they doesn't have, <coughs> they, they, they don't have a director and they design this in a sexual problem with the wife. What the reason it may be? There is there is any solution or no? Like, I don't think so. He doesn't have. <laughs> so men always like to experience with uh, different. <laughs> so that thing is always there with uh, women's sexuality also. That's a natural phenomenon. After. I mean, uh, Robert Sternberg, can we talk about it? Yeah, beautiful said that after time passes in a relationship, uh, if commitment is there, comment, comment, commitment will last. 
but the sensuality and uh, the sexuality aspect and these things will uh, drop down. That's what he's called uh, with a new partner. What's the way speaks of him? This is an important paper because sex is an important part of marriage. Without sex, marriage is incomplete. Very important. But I have two points. One is when you talk of sex therapy or treatment of importance, I think it is very important to see whether the relations between the uh, partners are harmonious. Then only then you should go for any form of treatment. See, this you you see Tom Sutra, if you have read the book. Even in councils, the king when he used to have sex with the woman, he used to do all the uh, things to see that he had, the lady likes him, pleases her, then only he would, would go for something. So the harmonious relation is very important. And second thing is, sex out of marriage is a taboo. So I personally feel this is my view, that when you take patients for therapy, it should not, it is only for marital partners. It should not be for girlfriends and boyfriends. This is my, my my uh, submission to you. Because if you do that, you are both promoting unethical practice. I don't know whether there are any guidelines on this. I asked Dr. T.S.S. Rao also. He didn't, he didn't give me a reply because he is supposed to be a pioneer in sex therapy. So these are two things that I want to say. Thank you, madam. Next. Uh, Thank you, Reed, uh, for a very good presentation. I missed one point, uh, it's relationship with the exercise because I read somewhere that the, you know, cardio, uh, prolonged cardio exercise increase uh, this um, estrogen, yes, and decreases uh, the testosterone. Is it true that you don't advise uh, male patients with erectile dysfunction not to do prolonged cardio exercise, or rather do other weight bearing exercise? Uh, actually, nowadays what is said that even in data and researches have seen that erectile dysfunction is a common predictor of future cardiac events. So if a person comes at age of 40, 45 comes with a problem of erectile dysfunction, that means he may be having some clock around the uh, because penile arteries are much more smaller than that of uh, coronary arteries. So that may be indication that the patient may have some <coughs> profile problem or a dyslipidemia or other cardiac problem that has to be assessed. So uh, I am not sure about weight bearing or heavy exercises, but uh, general exercises around brisk walking, or being healthy, or, uh, going for a job, that is always helpful for uh, sexual activity. Because it decreases the chances of other metabolic disorders which are always a risk factors and it also uh, promotes uh, uh, sexual well-being. <coughs> And uh, I'm not sure about the testosterone whether it decreases, but testosterone has a releasing uh, phenomena of uh, like a biomodal phenomena. Uh, when you say testosterone samples also, it is said that in the early morning 10 a.m. samples are shown to strength because that time the uh, testosterone may be uh, more high. So that reason can also be there of the distance. There is a last question for today. For a wonderful presentation. So sometimes what happens is when we see these young patients with sexual dysfunction and they say let's start with uh, let's say tadalafil. Okay? So we, we, uh, we actually practice a lot in teaching hospital where we give it tadalafil 5-MG for a prolonged period of time on a daily basis and the sexual improvement is so nice and everything becomes so well. Then we shift it to by weekly doses or sometimes weekend doses and it works well. But then there is always a guilty conscience on the treating doctor. Am I making him or am I helping him? Because the next time he's going to have a sexual attempt, he's going to have, should, do I have tadalafil in my pocket? Do I have tadalafil at my home? So what, what is the recommendation? How long should we use them? And then what is the way to table that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, tadalafil is the only drug that is, um, uh, I mean, um, Guidelines suggest which can be used uh, on a daily basis when it is in the dose of 5 mg. Uh, it can be used like 5 mg daily, uh, along that is not uh, mentioned, I guess. I mean, you can use till the dysfunction is there. But uh, you said you tried that the patient has a psychology that uh, because of this uh, pill, I am having an erection, and suddenly if you stop that, okay, that I may not have been that pill, so the automatic thoughts can lead to 
uh, another automatic talks and you may lose that direction. That is the common problem. So that's why history taking and this counseling part is very important, like prescribing these drugs. So if you are giving it in a young patient, uh, most probably is having uh, psychogenic etiology, which can be solved by uh, counseling, uh, re-educating the patient. Uh, what I was in young is like you don't have a stable relationship, you uh, like talks of shit, go around and uh, some girlfriends are that in a hurry, you do that activity. So because of those reasons also you may attract uh, that direction and you may be highlighting that issue that I may I have lived and this was throughout life. <coughs> so uh, that can be done, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. It was a very interactive session today. We had many senior uh, sirs and madam present here and were quite interested to know about all these aspects. I request Dr. Gangadharan to conclude this session and we will have uh, this certificate distribution. Thank you. I think it was a wonderful uh, presentation um, and you, you actually did very, very comprehensive and I think I can see from the questions from the audience there is a lot of interest in this game um, because there are people approaching psychiatrists, doctors with significant problems but I think not all of the people are actually not able to respond to those uh, needs very well. So there is more need for uh, sessions. Um, on, on this topic, uh, on sexuality in general, I think, in this topic and more, more education around this area. And thank you, thank you very much for doing this session. So thank, you. thank you to the audience for actually asking very intelligent questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this elaborative and important.